today I'm going to talk about Crossroads. I have a thing where I don't really like to talk about um, weird stuff, but there's something mystical in ancient traditions and religions. It doesn't even have to be religious, it just it was a superstition almost. The Crossroads were mystical. A lot of uh, Greek, ancient Greek deities are associated with crossroads. And so, this is coming from a scholarly perspective, by the way. I, I, I took a few um, ancient Greek courses in uh, university, and one of the things that we learned was that I think, like, Hecate, or Chthonian Hecate, is associated with the crossroads. She might be a deity at the crossroads, or you might be able to have better communication with her at crossroads. Like, I think people used to avoid crossroads. And by the way, if you don't know what a crossroad is, I'm talking about literally where one road crosses another road. Um, not sure about this point, but um, I think that people used to avoid crossroads at nighttime, just in case there were like spirits lingering around there. Um, so people were very careful about crossroads. And when I used to, when I was studying this in university, right? Because when we're talking about weird things, at least from me, um, the, I wouldn't go as far as to call them sources, but the places where I'm coming from are going to be kind of heavy, heavy hitting. So, for example, university course. Um, I have a textbook called Greek Ways of the Dead, or the Greek Ways of Death, and it's about how um, the ancient Greek people uh, dealt with death as a concept and what they did with bodies. They had large, large, large funerals, especially if you were rich, and it was started, they started to use it to compete and show off their wealth, and so there were a lot of laws, actually, which I read, like a literal translation of ancient laws by uh, Solon or Lycurgus. Solon being the more popular of them because uh, Plato references Solon in a few of his dialogues, at the very least, um, Theotetus, I believe. Regardless, Solon had to limit, like, how many um, funeral singers uh, could sing a dirge. Uh, like a song that you sing in respect of the dead um, how, how like there were a lot of limits on various death rituals and by that I mean like burial and funeral rituals brings us back to crossroads. Um, so I think Hecate has something to do with death, and so Hecate or Chthonian Hecate, which Chthonian just means kind of like having to do with the ground or not the underworld. Well, the underworld, but not like Hades. Um, and so, uh, you know, I learned crossroads are significant, there's something mystical going on there in the Greek ancient mind, and then I finished the course and didn't think about it anymore. <clears throat> and then, years later, I I'm reading, since we're getting weird, we might as well get completely weird, I'm reading Jewish Astrology and Cosmic Science. And it talks about, like, because Judaism is known for having a lot of laws and commandments, and then there are actually, like, a second layer with even more laws to protect you from breaking the, the laws from uh, God, apparently. And those are called, like, fences. <clears throat> and so, you know, one common fence is, when it comes to astrology, avoid it. But when you know what you're doing, like this, the author, Yaakov Cronenberg, you see his name in big letters on the bottom, goes through great lengths, the entire first section of the book, which is maybe 50, 60 pages, to explain 
why not in his opinion, but actually by referencing the letters of great rabbis and various rulings of great rabbis and the fact that um, certain rabbis, and rabbi, by the way, doesn't mean like priest or spiritual leader. It means like teacher or scholar. So we're talking about the the opinion of, of scholars. You can almost think of some of them, actually many of them have as much, as many years of formal education as a university professor. And oftentimes you'll find that, um, especially rabbis who, who do lecture for uh, frequently, tend to be as educated, if not more educated than university professors, just that it's in the field of uh, Torah study and the the writings that followed, like um, legalistic writings or case study writings or philosophy or commentary on the Bible on Scripture. Um, so, one of the things he says that is that you. Um, <clears throat> is that there was this, uh, I think it was Nebuchadnezzar, had a lot of contact with the Chaldean astrologers. And the Chaldean astrology is what's actually banned in the Bible. So if you're a religious person and you happen to be watching this for some reason, um, and you say, we can't do astrology, um, that's, that's forbidden according to, I believe, Deuteronomy. And what he goes in talk about here is that it doesn't actually say astrologer, which has a different name in Hebrew, uh, Mazalot, or something to do with somebody who studies the stars. Um, <clears throat> the word, the Hebrew word in the original, like English is not the original language of the Bible, it's actually written, uh, it was all translated from Hebrew. So... <clears throat> What it says in the Hebrew is Chaldean, or the word that, or the civilization that we translate into Chaldean. So Chaldeans were either a civilization or just a, a scholarly group or a group of magicians or something like this. And the way to tell if you're doing Chaldean astrology or if you're doing astrology that's quote unquote allowed is how specific it is so this sort of astrology can tell you like what sort of person you might get married to or what kind of career will be the most fulfilling to you um, by looking at say the seventh house or the fourth house or the tenth house and what sign that's in so for example if you have um, Libra in the tenth house an astrologer uh, a astrologer who's doing biblically permissible astrology will say something like okay, you might be good at communication one-on-one -on -one communication maybe therapy or um, something technical like law because Libra has to do with communication it's an air sign it's cardinal which means it's a go-getter um, and um, it has to do with balance uh, the scales, the scales of balance, uh, either in commerce, so maybe you're good in business, or justice, so maybe you're a good lawyer or judge, these sorts of professions, rather than, say, um, working with your hands, which might be something like an earth sign, something like Taurus, a Taurus person, or not a Taurus person, but somebody with Taurus in their midheaven might be uh, working in a, um, a hands-on field. It's not a value judgment, of course, um, but that's that. Now, a Chaldean astrologer, and we will get back to crossword, crossroads, but the Chaldean astrologer might say, you're going to be, because you have uh, Taurus or, um, what would be another one that might, maybe Capricorn, you're going to be a bricklayer, a mason, or you're going to be, because you have Aries, you're going to be an athlete, because Aries is associated with Mars, and martial energy is combative, and uh, hands-on, and some things like this. Um, 
or if your your sign is in Aquarius or Gemini, you're going to be a uh, a scholar, and not just that, you're going to be a scholar of philosophy, and you're going to go to the University of I don't know, you're going to go to Yale or something, um, like. Oh, by the way, and it's going to be in five years, and before that time, you're going to you're going to injure your right arm, which is going to make you unable to write until you start going to university, in which case it'll start healing then, and it'll affect how you take notes, and like, they'll get creepy, creepily specific, and that's the sort of future seeing that comes into the class of divination, but since... <clears throat> Anybody who practices astrology seriously does things like natal charts will tell you that it's very general. And even if you use techniques like perfections, annual perfections, or, or sorry, annual progressions, or secondary perfections, or even zodiac releasing, which can get very specific, it's still very general. Um, and so it can't tell you your future. It can tell you something that, say, a personality test, which is completely allowed by everybody, um, can tell you. Like, say, in my personality, I have high trait openness and high trait intellect, which means I might be good at technical things or artistic things or technical artistic things. Um, like, you know, Da Vinci was both an inventor and a painter. He might also have high intellect and high openness. And conscien low conscientiousness. So I'm not very good at keeping things organized. I can organize because that has to do with trait intellect. But when it comes to actually wanting to organize things, I'm not so good. So I can, you know, once a year organize my room, everything's nice. But then to keep that, to, keep, to make it stay that way, to upkeep, doesn't happen so much. So let's bring this all the way back to Crossroads. He says, I believe it was Nebuchadnezzar, if not, it was one of the other ancient kings that was non-Jewish, but was in contact with Jewish prophets. Nebuchadnezzar consulted his Chaldean astrologers, and he also did some sort of ritual at the Crossroads, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. because Nebuchadnezzar was a Babylonian, and uh, Greece, we know, had contact with Babylon, which in scholarly circles is usually referred to as Mesopotamia. Um, so Mesopotamia, the Greek got like half of its astrology from Mesopotamia. Like all the planets and a lot of the zodiac signs come from Mesopotamia slash Babylon. Um, our clock system, by the way, the reason why we have 12 hours um, and each hour is divided into 60 minutes, that's all Babylonian. So we're still affected by them, in case you didn't know. Um, so, yeah, it goes into all sorts of things. The king of Babylonia asked them, because they call, are called divinations, the Torah forbids us from divining. It says in Deuteronomy, they shall not be found among you, one who causes his or his sons and daughters to pass through the fire, one who practices divination, an astrologer, one who reads omens, a sorcerer, animal charmer, one who inquires of Yedoni, or one who consults the dead. Um, that's something that's starting to come back, is consulting the dead. You know, people think these things have died out, but like, we're, we're humans are pretty weird. Um... So I don't think I'll be able to find it, and I don't really want to pause the video, but um, he goes, like, he gets really specific. He says, um, the Kastim spoke of the king of Aramit because they spoke in the language of the nation they were from, and children of Aram, Ox, Kol, Netter, and Mash are not mentioned here. Not the Kadim uh, and not the Chaldeans. The people who lived in the land of Shinar were called Chaldeans. They were also called Kastim and Saranin, and other names. The name includes all these as false prophets and Chaldeans. And the Kastim, they were from the governmental families in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, the evil one. And they had their opportunity to serve their idols, and they were priests in the house of worship. And, they f and from this, they were called Kastim. 
those who draw down forces from the planets. That's what Kastim means. The Kastim were a specific class of Chaldeans. They were like the high priests. Um, but the Chaldeans were generally regular people, and therefore couldn't be called Kastim according to their class society, Rabbi Avram says. Um, Chaldeans mean, so by this he learns that Chaldean means all those groups of people who practice the forbidden astrology or divination. But regular astrologers are not called Chaldeans, since our rabbi said, he's quoting again, we don't ask the Chaldeans. They included among them Kastim, who drew forces from above, and those who engaged in wisdoms like uh, those concerning no knowing the future. Their words are like, are to us like we said. We don't ask sorcerers, Chaldeans, the readers of times, and other wisdoms that are similar to them, because the Chaldeans engaged in those arts. Now we've come to a distinguishing clarity what it means we don't ask Chaldeans rather than astrologers. And has been revealed to us what are the wisdoms that are suitable to learn and practice, and what are those that are permitted to uh, learn but not to practice. It appears from this, one who practices what is permitted, his intention is for the sake of heaven, um, he can be called a truly righteous one, even though the whole world calls him misguided. But if he forbids what is permitted and permits what is forbidden, we don't call this person misguided. We call him guilty because he has left the true path and mixed up right and wrong. Um, so he doesn't go into what I was looking for. Oh, the Talmud, it says about Shmuel, Samuel, prophet, who was a famous sage at the time, that he knew the paths of heaven like he knew the paths of Nehardea, which he grew up in. And so this is, oh, sorry, it's a different Shmuel. It's probably a rabbi named after the prophet. Um, yeah, just scanning this page. He doesn't talk about it here, but it's fascinating, and maybe I will find it and um, read it out in a different video. Because the he goes into four different ways of doing astrology that are forbidden. One of them like has to do with um, going out early in the morning, like before the sun rises, and collecting plants, and associating those plants with the stars. Like, things that we, that nobody does nowadays, that are too specific to be, like, made up. Um, and probably, you know, archaeologists have guesses, and historians have, like, guesses that this happened, and just, like, this is one of the things that is forbidden. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar consults a couple things. He goes to his astrologers, and then he does some sort of weird fire ritual at a crossroads. And, you know, it says, you know, he's doing something idolatrous here. But the fact that crossroads were f revered by the Babylonians as well as the Greeks, like I learned in my university course, was fascinating to me. And then, I think, I think it was here, um, these letters are also called mothers. By the way, this is one of the oldest um, Kabbalistic texts, Sacred Yitzir. It's Harriet Kaplan's translation of something like that. All this is just commentary, and then this tiny bit is the actual Sacred Yitzir. Oh crap, I lost my page. Uh, there it is. All these letters are called mothers, in the same sense that a crossroad is called a mother of a road, Ezekiel 21, 26. These three letters are called crossroads, since they form the horizontal links between Sifirot in the Tree of Life diagram. On a more basic level, these are mothers, because the number of horizontal links defines the order of the ray, as will be discussed below. Okay, let's, uh, I don't know why I keep closing this. Ezekiel 21, 26. This is an art scroll Tanakh. Uh, basically, uh, I don't want to say Old Testament, but it's kind of like the Old Testament with different translation approach, and it's in a different order because for some reason the Christians like took the Hebrew scriptures and kind of shuffled them. There's a reason why, but I won't go into it. Um, <clears throat> 21, 26. So I'm on 22 here. 
two rows. 21, 26. For the king of Babylon stood at the crossroads, at the head of two roads, to practice divination. This is the passage I was talking about. That's funny that the other book reference I found a reference to it, but not the astrology book. Here's how he did a, a divination. This is, by the way, um, the Romans used to do this sort of divination too. He shot arrows. And the footnote says on this passage, um, Nebuchadnezzar shot arrows skyward to see whether they would turn towards Rabbah or Jerusalem, and he and looked to his magic charms for guidance. Inquired of the teraphim, I and looked into the liver. I believe the teraphim is magic charms, or maybe even idols, like little statues. Um, and looking into a liver, so divination through liver is a huge thing in the ancient world. In my, or not, in Deborah Holding's book, Houses, Temples of the Sky, uh, she sort of guesses that um, the house system, the quadrant system from the houses was derived from uh, a sort of divination through entrails, divination through liver. It's right here in the beginning. Um, but essentially, the same way that an astrologer can look at the sky, and here we go and divide it into four quadrants. Um, you can do the same thing with the areas of a liver. And so here I can't read that when it's facing you, but it says at the top is pars or postica. It has to do with nocturnus, the guardian of the gates. And then pars anitica has to do with terrestrial deities, deities of nature. Um, on the left side is hostile, pars hostilis. And then on the right side is pars familiaris, or the familiar are good things. So I don't want to teach people how to do divination through entrails, <laughs> but as a general rule, the right side, um, or what's right is mine and what's left is enemy. So east or right is considered good. The sun rises in the east, um, and then left or west is considered bad. And so I guess you read the markings. And so here he is doing that. He's looking at a liver. Uh, did I say who's? The diagram above is reproduced as a duration of the div div division of sacred place presented in Jack Lindsay's Origins of astrology depicts a liver model derived from the ancient Mesopotamian or Babylonian tradition. So that's exactly what I'm reading to you about from the Bible. In his right hand, the divination indicated Jerusalem to set up battering rams, to give the order to murder, to raise the voice with shouting, to set, um, to set up battering rams at the gates. It, it repeats the word battering rams. Um, to pour out a ramp to build a siege tower, but it was for them a meaningless divination in their eyes, even though they had cast seven times seven divinations, and all of them pointed to them, so they, they repeated the divination process. And this recalled their iniquity, that they might be captured. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Hashem Elohim, since you cause your iniquity to be recalled, as your sins are revealed, as your transgressions are seen through all your deeds, because you recalled for your evilness, you will be captured by the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. So, as you defiled the wicked one, prince of Israel, whose day has come at the time of final iniquity, thus saith the Lord Hashem Elohim, remove the turban, lift off the crown. This will not remain as such. The, the degraded will be exalted, and the exalted will be degraded. Now, the footnote on that is, the crown of King Zedekiah will not remain with him much longer. King Jehoiakim, who has already been exiled, will show clemency, well, will be shown clemency, while Zedekiah, who currently occupies the throne, will be disgraced, being forced to watch all his sons slaughtered, and then he will be blinded and led off to Babylonia. This is the commentary of the Radak.
Desolate, desolate, desolate will I make Jerusalem. Such a thing, such a thing had never been until the coming of the executor of judgment, when I will deliver him into his hands. Um, although Zedekiah's predecessors were far from righteous, they were not punishment with punished with such degradation. So it goes on. Obviously, the uh, book of Ezekiel is quite long. Um, so is the rest of the Bible, but. If you never heard such like forceful poetry, poetic wording, um, you obviously haven't read scripture. Um, but that's that. You can see here we have crossroads associated with divination. Um, he was divining through liver. He was divining through shooting arrows to see which, like shooting them upward to see which, towards which city they would. Uh, tend and the result was that Nebuchadnezzar would be victorious as a punishment to the current king of Israel Zed Zed Zedekiah anyway the wicked king and the wicked king would be replaced by a good king in time so that's that I just wanted to show you that um, there's something to crossroads and I heard about them originally from Greek sources in university and then again it came up in my Jewish astrology book through the Babylonians. And then again, I got really sketched out because it appeared in a completely separate non-Jewish um, covering of a divination of entrails uh, by, of the Mesopotam uh, Mesopotamian method of divina divining by the liver. And then, um, lo and behold, the text that I'm kind of looking into now, say, say for Yitzira, references a passage in the literal Bible, and that passage has to do with divination by Intrell's Hello Cat. Uh, <laughs> so, that's um that's all i have to say for today uh, i took this video in three parts just because it was kind of noisy out there so i took a couple breaks um i know that this video was kind of like all over the place but i think i more or less stayed on the two categories of astrology and uh, divination and what's different about them and crossroads so I guess just as to recap, Crossroads used to be a good place to do divination or uh, speak to false gods. Um, and then astrology, Chaldean astrology or Babylonian or Mesopotamian astrology used to be divination as well. Modern and many forms of ancient astrology like Persian or medieval astrology um, were neither divinatory um, and occasionally not even predictive. And there's a difference between prediction and divination. A uh, great example is, for example, uh, a lot of business people, even religious business people, try to predict the stock market or predict the weather. They are not doing divination. Um, you know, and God is not angry that we try and see if it's going to rain on Friday. Um, so, modern astrology basically takes information similar to how science takes information and it tries to draw conclusions some of those conclusions are in the future um, but they're not very specific and so similarly oh, ow. similarly um yeah i don't remember where i'm going with this but uh essentially when it comes to crossroads, I don't think they're very magical. Maybe there's something interesting about them. When it comes to astrology, as I've said a few times, um, uh, I think it's good, it's wise to be careful about how you do it. But Chaldean astrology is long dead. So in general, unless you're doing something weird like uh, meditating on planets or edging into anywhere near uh, planet worship, which is said to be the source of all idolatry. Think about how a lot of ancient civilizations had a 
Sun God, um, Rome had one, for example. Soul, Invictus, Unconquerable Sun. As long as you're avoiding that sort of stuff, you should be okay. And what I've noticed is a lot of the astrologers that are doing like podcasts and writing books nowadays aren't doing anything weird. Although there was a, there's a lot of like shamanistic or new age astrology, which I would avoid in general. This isn't a video about that. Thanks for watching. Um, just to once again go over my sources, we have um, in order of my weird journey, there is Greek Way of Death. Don't remember who wrote it, but that was from my university course. Um, then we have <clears throat> Jewish Astrology of Cosmic Science by Yakov Cronenberg. This is not formatted very well, so if you do end up purchasing it, just keep that in mind. Um, it's a trans. A lot of it is transcripts from lectures. <clears throat> so it's it's just the whole approach, tone of it isn't so clear and easy to read. Additionally, if you are a beginner, don't get this book. It assumes you already know how astrology works. That you already know the basics, at the very least. Then I encountered again crossroads, or I encountered crossroads again in there. Then I encountered Mesopotamian. Um, divination through the liver, which a similar technique is applied to the sky in astrology for the house system. That's Houses, Temples of the Sky by Deborah Holden. This is um, widely referenced. It's a very small book, but um, a lot of people know about it. It's kind of a big thing in the astrological community. It goes into things like history. Uh, we have a forward by Robert Hand, who was one of the biggest uh, translators and writers on astrology in the, I think the 80s, around that period. Then Seyfri Yitzira, translation by Arya Kaplan, who's a legendary uh, sort of maverick rabbi who got into Kabbalah. Um, he almost finished his doctorate in physics. So the man is very intelligent and very uh, logical, rational, even scientific. Sorry, not even scientific. Literally, was almost was a scientist. Um, in a certain definition of that term, at least much more of a scientist than a lot of people who claim to love science. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, this is the Art Scroll Stone Edition of the Tanakh. I do not recommend getting this size. This is the uh, I believe is the student size. Get a full size. The commentary is. Um, you do not want to miss out on the commentary. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> this is literally <clears throat> uh, just the book of Joshua and Judges and nothing else. And <clears throat> as you can see, half of the page is commentary. And of course, it bleeds on to the other side. And then you have the original Hebrew and... <clears throat> Yeah, the original Hebrew. So, um, I think we'll end on a note about Bible translations. Is Art Scroll the most accurate Bible translation? The answer is no. If you want accuracy, Koren. Um, the Koren Jerusalem Bible is much more accurate. I think much more literal. But um, this one is readable. And it follows the orthodox tradition in its approach to translation. Some say it follows Rashi too closely, but Rashi is like the most helpful and greatest commentator for uh, foundations of interpretation because he just wrote like the basic stuff. He didn't get fancy. So following Rashi is like a good thing in my opinion, especially if it's, you know, an everyday um, reading tool and you're not like trying to study the depths if you are trying to study the depths get a bible in hebrew and learn hebrew and the benefit is any good translation if you want to know if your translation of the bible is good if you have a bible the way to tell is if the original is on the other side notice how we've got hebrew on one side and english on the other
You might say, that's strange. Why would you have such a standard? Well, everybody has such a standard. This is Aristotle and some other writers. And would you look at that? English on one side, Greek on the other. It's standard for all translations of scholarly works to have the original language on the other side. And I was reading Seneca's De Ira. It had Latin on the other side, the original. So if your translation is hiding the original, often not on purpose, just because that's the standard, but let's, let's flip it. If your translation is not hiding the original, that, you know, gives it some credibility. Anyway, we are getting off topic. Thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time. I'm going to get into some more weird stuff, as promised. Uh, just starting to practice. Uh, Alright.